the death has been announced of Bobby Moore, the football captain who led England to victory in the World Cup. He was only 51 and had been suffering from bowel cancer for some time. His last public appearance had been as a commentator for Capital Radio only seven days ago during an England match against San Marino, ironically at Wembley, the scene of some of his greatest triumphs. In a professional career, lasting almost 30 years, he was awarded 108 caps for England, a record for an outfield player. He led West Ham to success in the FA Cup final of 1964, to the European Championship in 1965, and England to the World Cup in 1966. He was elected Footballer of the Year, and many times Player of the Year for his club West Ham in the East End of London. He was awarded the OBE, in 1967. Although he subsequently played for Fulham and in the North American League, his career in football management, both for Oxford City in the Ryman Isthmian League and for South End United in the fourth division, was less successful, and he retired in May 1986. Sir Alf Ramsey, the manager of England in 1966, said today, he was my right-hand man, one of the best defenders world football has ever seen. This is the saddest day of my life. The Brazilian footballer Pelé, Bobby Moore's opponent in both the 1966 and 1970 World Cups and considered by many to be one of the greatest of all footballers, said, his death is a big loss for the human race. He was a true and honorable gentleman, my friend and my brother. It was also announced today that there is to be a memorial service for Bobby Moore at Westminster Abbey, the first sportsman ever to be so honored. We all have our heroes whether it's in the football world or politician world or actor. We all, we all have that. It's something, you know, it's just part of your life to look forward to actually seeing him or seeing her. Or, and that's what, why they have a role to play as well. Heroes have a role to play to the public. It's not easy, but he did it well. My dad told me a lot, a lot about Bobby Moore. My granddad told me a lot about Bobby Moore. You know, I think when you think about Bobby Moore, you know, you just think legend. Um, and the biggest thing I think about him was he was a gentleman, you know, and for me, as England captain, you know, you're following in uh, certain footsteps of captains and Bobby Moore was a great hero of mine. You know, what a captain he was. Because I want to be liked, like Bobby Moore was liked. And, you know, he was liked by all generations. You're just a great fellow, that's all. When they made the mold for Bobby Moore, they threw it away, didn't they, when he died? This is... I've never met anybody like him. He was always a... kept in contact, he was always a... well, he's just... just a great friend. More than a great friend, really. Sorry to put me through that. No, it's not a problem. It is a problem, but it's difficult when you can't talk about someone that you want to talk about. It was his moment. It was sort of, cometh the moment, cometh the man, whatever it is that, that quote is. And, and he seemed to have come. It's a bit like a messiah, you know, out of the gloom of the 50s and, 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 and the debt and everything. and, and uh, our, our sports history wasn't very great. And he, and he just came, he was like a gleam of light right the way through. And as I said that, the sun came out outside. Isn't, isn't that amazing? Did you notice that? It's been raining all the morning and I said he came out like a gleam of light and the sun came out. It's getting eerie here. <laughs>
Yes, I just miss the laughter that I had with him and the daftness of silly young men behaving dreadfully. I mean, you know, dear Lord above. I was guest of honour one night at the, uh, the Café Royal, the, the National Boxing Club, and they said, you can bring your guest. I said, well, bring Bobby Moore. Oh, of course. So they had two huge photos of Moro and I hung from the ceiling and we walk in, our guest and his guest, and it's all <laughs> rounds of applause and we're in the evening suits and as I said, Moro was the film star so we've walked in, thank you very much. And it was all presented and all that and the dinner and I said a few words and all that and there was a tray and now the boxing will begin, gentlemen. There was a bit of a boring fight was on and he said, did you know, he said, Diana Ross is on at the talk of the town. I said, is she? He said, yeah. Should we go and see her? I said, yes. So out we go. And we end up in the front row of the talk of the town watching Diana Ross. And back in the, uh, in the boxing, in the Cafe Royal, I said, now our guest and his guest will be... And the fellow said, they've pissed off hours ago. And so all hell broke loose. I mean, I wasn't... I, I don't know. The next one in my office, the phone man, they have gone potty. I said, well, what did you say? I said, you were taken ill and Bobby <laughs> took you home. I said, well, what did they say? He said, taken ill, they were seen going in trap discotheque at three o'clock in the morning and we photographed to prove it. Robert Frederick Chelsea Moore, the only child of Robert and Doris Moore, was born in the East End of London in Barking on April the 12th, 1941, within a mile or so of Dagenham, the birthplace of Sir Alf Ramsey, with whose name Bobby Moore would be forever associated. My sister had a very difficult birth with him and she was taken off to the hospital. They delivered the baby there. At that time we were having so many terrible air raids, daytime and nighttime. And where they lived in Waverley Gardens was near the Barking Power Station. And when Doris came home, there was a very bad raid that night. So much so that she the house of ceilings were falling in and the windows and everything. It was horrendous. And they tried to get an ambulance to take her over to my mother, who lived the other side of Barking. And she arrived there about midnight with the baby. And Big Bob, as we called Bobby's father, Big Bob said to me, take this, we've been bombed out. And I took this bundle and that was Bobby. After German bombers had been over this London district, we endeavoured to find out how the raid had affected the morale of the people. We wish Hitler could see and hear the following interview with a woman whose home had been demolished. Uh, where were you when the bomb? Came well, down? in bed. Where do you think I was? And uh, <laughs> what happened? And uh, what happened to you? Well, it blew me out. Blew you out of bed. He must have blew me out. Oh, well, but I don't remember no more. You managed to get uh, out, out of the house all right. Yes. Uh, has it uh, hurt you at all? Do you feel any effects of it? No, only a bit shook. God will save our king and queen. My nan, Doris, daddy's mum, lived there for 51 years. You know, she would never move away from her house. That was, that was hers. She was an immensely proud woman. In fact, she was so keen on him looking just so for the games that every Friday night at home, it was quite a ritual. Don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like me sad about this, but... While I was cleaning the boat, she used to go, even go to the trouble of washing and ironing his football laces. She had some little quirks. I always remember mashed potatoes. She would always use an ice cream scoop. And you would always have three. Even if you just said two, she would always put three on the plate. Well, I remember on one occasion when I took him to Ilford to watch Barking play Romford in the Essex Senior Cup final. And that's where Bobby really lost out. Well, we got talking to some people next to us and they kept giving Bobby sweets. Well, after they found out we were Barking supporters, they stopped giving him any more sweets. <laughs> <laughs> one lad called for him one evening, a bit on the big side, and 
I suggested to him that he was a bit of a big boy to be playing with Bobby, and he said, well, he was the only one that's got a ball. It was the greatest place I could imagine to be brought up if he was interested in football. Bobby was born in Barking, and I was born in Dagenham, which is sort of a football kick away. But it was great for enjoying everybody in the street, whether you played cricket, football, everything. Everybody was out and playing until time to go, go in and go to bed. And, and uh, you could be over the parks, which youngsters really have a problem to do now. And in the streets, of course, there was no cars. So there was all these areas of leisure in its own way that was fantastic. And it, street football, most likely, uh, helped you do the right things because you couldn't be sliding in and doing those sort of things. You have to stay on your feet on, on concrete. I always say everyone's a coach, mum and dad especially. I think mum and dad give you your first lessons and imprint on your mind what your conscience will be for the rest of your life. And it was an East End thing then. It, families were really, really close. If I could say to my son, you know, I hope you would turn out like someone, it would be Bobby Moore. <laughs> you know, because he, he just, he seemed to have everything. He didn't, he didn't seem to have any flaws. I mean, we all have flaws, but uh, if he did, he, he certainly hid them and, and then covered them up because on the pitch he was immaculate. He had immaculate dress. He, he, he was intelligent. He, he was great with kids. He didn't get in any sort of trouble. Who's your favourite footballer, Tony? Um, you. Yeah. Yeah, I go with Is he your favourite? That's, that's you. And was it Peter Bonetti? Who do you support? Who do I support? Yeah. My wife and kids. Who else do you think? It's just a quality that people have, you know. Knowing you're, you're someone special, but not acting like you're someone special. I think that is, that is, a, that is a quality in people, and he, he, he had that. You know, he didn't think he was better than anyone else as, as a person. He might have thought he was a, a better footballer than, <laughs> than anyone else. But uh, it didn't matter whether you were from the East End on a street corner, lying in the gutter, or whether you, you were the Queen. He was quite at ease in, in everyone's company and treated everybody equally. When you were a youngster, Bobby, you spent all your time playing games. But I gather it's about this time that your physique earned you a nickname. Do you remember what it was? Can I say it here? Yes. Or dare I? Yeah, it's Tubby. Tubby. Tubby and Fatso. Tubby and Fatso, yes. <laughs> That's right, we got a picture of you somewhere here of, of Tubby or Fatso uh, playing with Leighton School's district team. He won a place at Tom Hood's Technical College at Leighton in London, and people had been, what do you call them, scouts, when they've been out keeping their eye on somebody that they thought might be a good footballer or something like that. And the scouts went to see Doris and Bob when he was about 14, and you could leave school when you were 14 then, and said, we would like him to go to West Ham. Uh, would you let him go? So she said, not yet, not until he's 16. And she said, he yet has his O-levels to do, and I want him to get his O-levels. Well, the boy stayed until he was 16, and he got, I think, eight O-levels. Yeah, I first saw him when he was 12 years of age and uh, at the time I was captain of West Ham and the manager asked me if I'd coach the youth team. I lived in Barkingside and he stood at the bus stop and he said, can I sit next to you, Mr Allison? So I said, certainly, Bobby. And then every, after every training session we used to go home and he used to talk to me and, and ask me different things and, and I used to tell him uh, you know, different things about training. And, and the one thing that stuck in his mind, I think, was that I said to him, you must always know what you're going to do with the ball before you receive it. And that was one of his, one of his great qualities. Malcolm was probably the, the, the start. He was, he was the one who went with, with Walter Winterbottom to Lillyshaw. And he came back with, full, with folders full of ideas and, and, and little diagrams, which was, wasn't, wasn't heard of before then. I think all we can say is that um, in our matches that we played where we failed, we seem to have 
run into a, 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 our worst period of football, and we've made blunders in defence which we shouldn't have made. Lillyshaw was the centre of coaching where people did their coaching badge. So Walter Winterbottom was probably the first director of coaching that England ever had. And Malcolm would take us in team practices where things that would have been unheard of in the days where you, you sort of run away from the ball and you make space for yourself and wide players would just bend the ball in early. Things that other people weren't even aware of and West Ham were probably the first to do things like that. We would use these and we changed the strip from the old fashioned big shin pads and uh, you know, laced up thing. We were starting to become almost like model players with little shorter shorts and no shin pads. Like teams used to look at us and they used to think we were fairies. You know, we were look at it like you go, you go to Bolton or go to Burnley, and like from coming from London on the train with your bag and immaculate dresses. They just they batter you. They just kicked you off the park. When Malcolm left um, West Ham mainly through illness, and uh, Noel Cantwell took over. He played a great part on my uh, footballing career as well. And I was, I was also lucky when I first played for England youth and England under 23s, um, our West Ham manager at present, Mr Ron Greenwood, was manager at the time of both sides then. He was a very clean footballer, but if the kicking was on, I mean, he was a very strong lad. He could take care of himself. And there was uh, one match, they were playing Manchester City, and Mike Summerby went over the ball to the West Ham fullback and done him. And Moro and they were friends, Moro and Sunby, and Moro just said to him, That wasn't very nice, was it, Michael? And he said, some of you said, I felt terrible. I was being told off by my hero. He said to me once, he was saying, I said, I wish I had carried on playing as a kid, you know. And because uh, uh, Chap at Spurs had said uh, one of the Terry Venable's assistants had said they were close at one stage to being interested in me when I was a boy playing football. And I said, I wish I'd carried on playing. And he said, well, why didn't you? And I went, well, to be honest, Bob, I wouldn't have made the grade. He said, I said, I couldn't head the ball. I couldn't run. I couldn't have a shot on goal. Could never get over the halfway line. Neither could I. And I earned over 100 caps and no one noticed. <laughs> seemed to do everything much more easily than most people. He always seemed to have lots of time, he always seemed to look polished and never saw him arguing with the referee. I never saw him foul anyone, you know, I saw him tackle lots of players, you know, and, and dispossess them, but I never saw him ever foul anyone. He would see an overall picture and then suddenly he would go in and he would, and, and he would win a tackle and, and you would think to yourself, well, I, did, I, I wouldn't have thought that's where it was coming from, but he did, you know. And he, he just instinctively went and did it. He was superb in, in every department and every decision he seemed to make on the field was the right one. He was winning tackles, you know, when he was the last man, but his eye was never off the ball and he would go in and come out with it. I used to often think, but I wish, I wish I could do that. You know, I wish, I wish I could tackle, I wish I could win the ball like that and I wish I could dispossess people in that. I suppose that wasn't my job, but I really was an envy of him. Bob was probably the slowest player I ever played with. 
I mean, he, he was, he had no pace at all, but nobody ever ran him. He just had that ability to know exactly where they were going to go. I mean, the number of times Bob would already be on his way to something before it had actually happened on the field, and it would happen exactly the way he had anticipated it. People talk about his ability in the air. In practice matches, I'm not going to bowl about he never had a ball. We go on the field, and if he had a head of ball, he always got it. I can't ever remember seeing Bob, when I played with him, ever jumping to head a ball and somebody beating him to it. I mean, I've got pictures of me and Bob after the World Cup final after it, and there's not a mark on him. He's like, at the end of the game, his shorts are completely white, his socks are up, his shirt is in good nick. He was always so well-dressed. Everything he wore seemed to be exactly what it should be. You could play on the muddiest of pitches and Bob would come out looking like he hadn't kicked the ball about. I once got the better of him. Now, if you get the better of him once <laughs> in 20 years, that's, that's not bad going. And that was the, I'd, I'd scored a hat-trick against uh, West Ham at, uh, at Old Trafford. And uh, Bobby was well known as he, he didn't dive in. His timing was immaculate. He, you know, he was never the fastest player in the world, but his, his timing and his reading of the game was just so special. And to get one up on him, and so for me to have that one memory <laughs> and get and get, a, get one over on him, <laughs> I sort of dummied him a little bit, and he he, he fell for it slightly, and uh, I scored. It's the biggest compliment I can pay him as a player. Yeah, <laughs> it's true as well. Yeah, I should have hated him really instead of loving him. <laughs> now West Ham, it's their first appearance in a peacetime cup final since the drama of that historic opening match at Wembley in 1923. At the toss-up, West Ham skipper Bobby Moore and Preston's Bobby Lawson. All set, let battle come out. each side matching the other in pace and stamina. Two goals each and only minutes left. Into injury time and the Hammers hammering at Preston's door. They broke through in the last minute of the match, one of the most dramatic winning goals ever seen at Wembley. So West Ham win the FA Cup, a magnificent sequel to their victory over the cup holders in the semi-finals. the trophy from the Earl of Harwood, the cup which today can be a passport to even greater things among the cup holders of Europe. Well done, Hammer! Wembley once again, where they won the FA Cup 12 months ago. West Ham prepared to add another trophy to their treasure chest. Their opponents, TSV Munich 1860, a team with a name as long as its history. Germany's oldest club, could they become the first German team to win a major European trophy? West Ham kick off before a record crowd for a bloodlit match in England. A free kick taken by Bobby Moore, and Seeley's there again to send it on its way. Fantastic performance. And besides the trophy itself, there's a mini cup for skipper Bobby Moore, who's led his team to one of the most tremendous triumphs, not only in his team's history, but in the whole history of British football. I was paid five pounds in the summer and six pounds in the winter. But uh, in those days, I mean, in those days, I don't think we we worried about money too much. You know, you just wanted to. I know it sounds a little bit silly, but. You know, you just wanted to be a professional footballer to make it. Because actually my father didn't want me to be a professional footballer because uh, I was learning his trade, which was a Thames lighterman. So it was handed down from father to son and I was learning the trade when I was 14 during the summer holidays. And I got played for England schoolboys and the scouts came round and my father was very reluctant to let me go into to football. It was pitiful what they were paid at the time. I mean, you, you were very much in a slave era um, where the the rewards that were coming from the, the performance, the entertainment that these people were given, um, was not passed on to them. Uh, it, was, it was soaked up by the directors and by the clubs who did not develop the grounds and the game as they should have done. They didn't put enough into the grassroots. Bobby was thinking of moving for an extra 20, 30 pound a week. Brian Clough was trying to tempt him. 
sent him a little envelope with some lace in it um, from Nottingham lace in it. I mean, could you imagine trying to tempt Mrs. Beckham with a, you know, a little lace doily? You know, this is the kind of thing you can have if you come to Nottingham, Victoria. I don't think so. <laughs> When Alf Ramsey took over in 63, the England side was in disarray. We had been going downhill for a very, very long time since the Hungarians took us apart in 52 uh, and scored 13 goals in two games against us. So Elf had a look at it and said, this is no good. You know, I've got to change things. And I haven't got that much time to do that. And of course, he actually came out saying England would win the World Cup in 66. Well, I think the players believed in him, quite frankly, but the rest of the world didn't. England seem to be figuring in a lot of predictions that the other team managers are making. Um, you know, they say, oh, I fancy England for the World Cup. Does this worry you at all that you're a fancy team? <laughs> well, <laughs> it seems uh, extraordinary to me that uh, managers should tip other teams. Uh, uh, it seems that I'm the only manager that tips in England or t tips their own particular team. I would pay no notice uh, to this at all, in as much as every manager uh, in charge of the teams that are competing in the World Cup competition have one object in mind, and that is to win the World Cup. So your prediction stays as England for the World Cup, is it? Of course. He ruled by a certain amount of fear. I think there was an element of fear, which I think started when he, he confiscated some people's, some players' passports when they went out on a, on a night out and they shouldn't have done in the early days. So his reputation, I've never met anybody as powerful in, in a management position in football or in business. And I've been in that in 20 odd years since Alf. Alf had a great saying when he picked new players to the squad. And you said, well, he's oh, you've got him in the squad today, Alf. It was, he will never let me down. And I, players came into that squad very quickly to be looked at. And in the space of two days with a couple of half an hour training sessions and drinking a couple, a couple of cups of tea in the hotel, and some of them were never seen again. We were on an airplane, I think we were coming back from uh, Brazil in this, and uh, <laughs> it was particularly warm on this, on this occasion, of course. And uh, we were in our suits and God knows what, and uh, Bobby Charlton said to Bobby Moore, um, Bob, go and ask Elf if we can take our jackets off. So, Bob said, no, <laughs> I'm not going to ask him. <laughs> so, I know what he's going to say. He says, you go and ask him. So he, he said, well, all right. So he <laughs> went to the front of the airplane. He said, Elf, um, do you think that uh, during the trip we could take our jackets off? So Elf looked and said, I will give it some thought, Bobby. So well, thank you very much, Elf. So <laughs> Bob comes back. He walks back down the airplane and said, he said, Bobby. <laughs> so Bobby walked away from the front. He said, I've given it a great deal of thought. <laughs> he said, we'll keep our jackets on. <laughs> there was a strength of identity between them in that way. They had come from the same background, of course, from the East End of London. But they had a different attitude to their roots, which is where they separated. Uh, Alf tried to move away from his roots. He took elocution classes. He didn't like it when dear old Eddie Bailey at Tottenham, the Tottenham coach, called him Dagenham Dark. He was not happy with that. And tried to improve himself socially. Bobby remained very much the local West Ham boy in his heart. Never forgot where he came from. Moved into Chigwell, which was adjacent. Um, retained the, the, all the connection with the boys from the hood, if you like, as we would call them now. I welcome all our visitors and feel sure that we shall be seeing some fine football. It now gives me great pleasure to declare open the eight World Football Championships. image that Bob portrayed, which was absolutely true. Everything that's been said about Bobby Moore is absolutely true. But there was another side to Bob. 
He did have a wicked, if not evil, sense of humour. Many is the time when he's gone along the line of the England team introducing the players by the wrong name. You know, Ray Wilson would be George Cohen and uh, I'd be Roger Hunt and more I'd go, this is Roger Hunt, you know, and they'd all go, and they wouldn't know. I mean, this is the FA officials and dignitaries, and they wouldn't know. And Moro, just straight faced, you know. And he'd it, do things like that. And I think Bobby got me into more trouble than and any other footballer I've ever known. And I mean, and I've played with some villains. He just led by example all the time. He wasn't a ranter and a raver, like I was, for instance, I was a nuisance. But Bobby was totally the opposite of me. Everything he did, even from the way you walked out, he had his head up high. He strutted out. He had this arrogance. He was immaculate. He shorts. He took more time getting his shorts in the right place before you went out. You would never thought beating under that chest there was a real toughness, you know, as well as ability and a desire in there to be great, to be leading England. The country was not in ferment about the World Cup. In 66, we'd been late entrance. We'd had a terrible run. For the opening game against Uruguay, you could walk up and go in and pay at the turnstile. It's a remarkable thought when you think about the ticket for World Cups now. And the, you know, the, you know, it's quite extraordinary. And it really didn't happen until the Argentina game with Ratin and the great drama that surrounded it. And I remember Bobby saying once that uh, if Ratin hadn't been sent off, we wouldn't have had the 70, 74, 78 World Cups because there was no penalties and we'd have still been playing nil-nil with Argentina, so... <laughs> People forget England was in terrible economic trouble at the time. I can remember um, devaluation and asking my parents, what does this mean for us? And, and we were frightened. And it was a regular thing for the Prime Minister to go on television and explain the latest crisis. When Wilson turned up at the World Cup, he had been in America begging for money to save us. He flew back into Heathrow, landed at 1.30, tried to participate in the celebrations afterwards and was only narrowly prevented from lining up alongside Bobby Moore in the World Cup at Wembley. In fact, about 18 months before the World Cup final, they realised it was going to be a big deal. And the relevant minister asked uh, the Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, for £500,000 to... Uh, patch up all the stadiums that they were going to need to play a World Cup. Wilson said, watch the World Cup. So I was one of the younger players. I was second youngest, Bawley was youngest, and I was only 22. So it came very early in my career. Jeff was only 23, and Bobby was 23 stroke 24. So, you know, he was very young to be a World Cup captain as well. So he came quite young to us. And I don't think we realised at that stage what we'd done. Years after, people come up to me and say, I was there. I was there when you won the World Cup. There must have been 500,000 people in that ground to see that game. <laughs> because everybody had a damn ticket, you know. They want you to know that they were there, that they were part of it, you know. and they. Like, people come back with their tickets. They would never throw away. Little bits of photographs, you know, and uh, one man even showed me a photograph of himself and the crowd. <laughs> and this thing is beautifully preserved. Put my charts on first, straight completely. Put my feet in the bath one more, put my socks on, then put my boots on, soft soap on first, and then put my boots on. Then put oil on, take all my charts off again. I've got my socks and boots on. Um, put oil on. Wash my hands, get my shots on, put my contact lenses in, cheer it on, tell me tea there, I was ready. I can remember saying to Jackie Chocolate about 5 and 20 past half past two, I said, I can't believe this, Jack. I said, you know, it's one, probably one of the most important matches that we're going to be playing in. Yeah, there's chaos in the dressing room. So he said, well, yeah, it's chaos because it's a World Cup final. When the bell went for you to go and line up outside in that tunnel, you couldn't actually hear the crowd, but you could see the light at the end of the tunnel. But as you move towards the end of that tunnel, you could hear a murmur. And when you hit you know, the fresh air, the noise was unbelievable. Bobby, um, when he was 23, had uh, testicular cancer. And um, 
No, very few people knew it. I mean, we didn't, we didn't, obviously Ron Greenwood knew. But it was really tough for Bobby because, I mean, he had to go to training and had these blue crosses on his back where he had to have, you know, radi ray, deep ray treatment that he had. And it was very alarming because in those days, cancer was so frightening, the word cancer. In fact, when he was first diagnosed, the doctors told me, and I didn't want them to tell Bobby. I don't know why, but I didn't, and they, they said that he had a tumor. It affected him very deeply psychologically. He, he developed insomnia from there on in. He took it, he was very brave. I mean, he never complained, it happened. I mean, he was a baby. He was concerned at the time whether ever he would ever play football again, let alone get back into the team and lead the team to a victory. So that was even a greater victory than anything for me to watch him pick up that World Cup. I, I was just thought, what a man. I never felt at any time that we were not going to win. We thought it was going to be a hard game, and when we went one nought down, uh, we were very pleased to get an equaliser very early on. Free kick was given against myself about halfway inside their half, and fortunately enough, the ball stayed in my vicinity so I could get hold of it quickly. The ball was right, just the timing of the run was right, and it was a perfect edit. that when we were 2-1 in front, but um, then we equalised virtually with the last kick of the game. And all of a sudden, everything just seemed to drain from you. And you felt as, as weak as a kitten. You know, I don't know if it was a tension or you realised that you was on the threshold of greatness, you know. We felt that um, going into extra time was our own fault, actually. was very angry. It was one time when I think he really raised his voice. He said, you've won it once. You've won this once, he said. And you've given it away for something stupid. Go and win it again. Don't anybody sit down. Look at the Germans. Their socks are down, their shirts are out. He said, they're dead. I've turned to the linesman and I've said, go. Go. I kept saying to the linesman, who was a Russian, I believe, that's a goal, goal. And the referee was Swiss, he came over, hardly said a word to each other because they couldn't understand each other. It happened so quickly and I was right in line. If I said yes, it was a goal, I'd, I'd uh, be telling fibs. It wasn't so well known in England, but somehow it was well known in Europe. But the linesman who came from somewhere in southern Russia had lost I believe something like 30 to 40 relatives to the Germans in the war. And once the referee was walking over to him, there was no way the Germans were going to win that decision. They might as well have packed up before they had the conversation. They were finished. They had to play another half hour, didn't they? Extra time, apparently. And I said, I can't stand anymore. I've had enough. I'm going to take the dog for a walk. And I think I was the only person out in Worcester that afternoon, me and my dog. Mm. But uh, when I came back, I was in time to see just the last part of the, and I can remember it now, I can see Bobby over there, the, the gold post over there, Jeff Hurst was just in front. And Bobby seemed to know what he was going to do. He kicked that ball over. Jeff got it, turned it around, and into the net it went. I was screaming my head off at Bob to get rid of it. I mean, he'd already looked at the, at the box, and they're all telling us it's time's up, it's finished, and Bob, not Bob, pulls it down on his chest, 
takes it, turns on, has a look up, nudges it with his foot, has a look, saw Jeff running away from him, and then produced a ball that I was never capable of over Jeff's right hand shoulder. I mean, Bob would play to the last seconds of a game. When I just approached the top of the stairs and come around the corner for the first time, all I could visualise was uh, the Queen in shining white gloves. You know, and we'd been playing on a very, very wet pitch, and all I could think of is dirty, wet, muddy hands. I can't possibly shake hands with her like this. And the first thing I could think of was to clean my hands, and which I did on top of uh, a lovely laid-out velvet just prior to meeting her. You know, I suppose it might have been a silly thing to do, um, you know, to many, many people, but it was just an immediate reaction was that, my goodness me, those lovely white gloves, I can't dirty them. We were a family when we played for England. We were a family, and the thing that bonded us all together was... Um, was the, the job that we had to do. We had a very difficult job to try to win the World Cup. And Alf Ramsey used Bobby Moore as the, the in-between between himself and the players. And he must have done the job as good as anybody can do it because we never fell out with anyone else in the side. We talked about everything openly. We were, if someone did something wrong, we were criticised, but it was accepted. And, and the, the bond was the thing, really, that helped us to actually be successful. And Bobby Moore's relationship with Alf and the rest of the players was what made this happen as much as anything else. And we were a family. So uh, when you're a family, you know, and, and something happens, Bobby, Bobby Moore dies, then you're hurt, don't you? I met Bobby when I was 16, or nearly 16, at the local dance hall. It was called the Ufa Palais. And it was a Saturday night hop, and we all used to go there. And Bobby used to come up, and I danced with him a few times. He was quite keen on me. And actually, I think after the second date, he, well, dance, um, that I met him at, he took me home, and he, he asked me to go out with him. And I stood him up. And it wasn't until I met him, I was with my mother in a taxi driving along, and I actually pointed him out. And I saw that's that young man, or young boy, who'd invited me out. She said, oh, Tina, he looks absolutely gorgeous. I knew nothing about football. I didn't really go very much, you know, I didn't understand it. But then Bobby got chosen for the World Cup in Chile in 1962. And from there on in, he was being groomed for that sort of burst of stardom. So we all went there Christmas Eve, and it was like we got in there about one o'clock, finished training, popped in for a couple of beers. Suddenly, the phone, about two o'clock, the phone goes, it's, it's Tina ringing up for Bobby. She, she, they're going out that evening to a function somewhere. He's got the turkey in the car as well that's probably going melting or whatever, frozen turkey, I think we had. So the phone goes and Jimmy says, ah, it's Tina. So Bobby gets, I'll be, home, I'll be home in an hour. No sign. Two hours later, Bob's still in the pub. Tina rings up. If you don't come home, I'm going to tell your mum. Puts the phone down. Hour later, in walks Bobby's mum. Now, Bobby's in there, he's the captain of England. The, the pub's full up, the music's going. There's all the girls out of the offices probably in there, and it's, it's a, you know... In walks Mrs Moore. Next thing, she's leading him out of the pub by the arm, and he's saying, but mum, I'm 31. I want to spend my life with a girl like you. Ba -ba 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 -ba. The sixes were a changing point. The classes all sort of intermingled. And then the abolition of the maximum wage for footballers, they started earning a little bit more money and they became slightly more glamorous. In fact, when I knew Bobby, I earned 11 pounds a week and Bobby earned eight pounds. So, you know, when people say, gosh, you know, nowadays, the girls go after footballers for the money. <laughs> In my case, it wasn't. I think he went after me for mine. <laughs> Can I dance with you? Ba -ba -ba -ba. Well, it was the East End took over the West End, really. I mean, all the lords and ladies and things had to step to one side. And everything, like, we, the photography broke through, the rock and roll broke through, and England had control of the world creatively, really. I mean, every day someone thought up something, you know, Mary Quant would invent the miniskirt and they discovered Jean Shrimpton or Twiggy or something. The World Cup was the icing on the cake. Bobby broke the mould of the muddied oaf who should know his place in football. Bobby represented something good about Britain, about England specifically. 
He represented hope. He represented the possibility of achievement. He represented strength and honesty and, and dignity, even though he'd been in some scrapes, which you know, any young boy from the East End is going to be. But he, he stood for something which this country needed at the time. And at the time of his death, the country probably needed even more. We have a young society which doesn't have as many good values as it should. I just think the class system always saw the game as the sort of sweaty end of the market, really. They would much prefer synchronised marbles or something like that. And it would be, you know, yachting or rugby, or, which is great. We all love those things too. But, you know, you never saw a football come out of Weybridge, did you? I mean, I never noticed that. Bobby really always wanted to better himself. From the first time I ever met him, always wanted to aspire to better things. His manners, when I first met him, he was a very nice mannered boy, it was inbuilt, and he was very polite, but he became a little bit more polished as he went along. He watched people and, you know, he would stand up and pull the chair back for somebody and spread their napkin. The house in Moorlands was lovely. He reached what he wanted, that was what he wanted, to live in a lovely place like that. His dream house, he had it built, he designed it himself. He hated smoking, and if people were smoking, he'd follow them around with a dustpan and brush. So if anything came out or, you know, if there was any ash on the floor, he'd go around and sweep it up. You know, if he had a beer can there, he'd always put the lid or the, the, the ripper actually in, in the beer can as soon as the beer can was finished. He'd take it to the bin kind of thing. He hated mess. He used to write everything in his diary, in pencil, so that he could scribble it out if, you know, his commitments changed, whereas I still to this day sort of just, you know, rub out with biro. And just, uh, he had certain ways of, of, this sounds really odd, but he used to, he, when we used to stay at his house over in Putney, after we'd had dinner, he'd want to do the washing up because he had a certain way of doing the washing up, his own system. He'd be like, it's okay, Dad, I can do the washing up. He'd be like, no, it's okay, I can really do it. He was very tidy. He'd have all his coins by the side of his bed, sort of going from big coins to small coins, and everything was colour-coded. I mean, I was a real daddy's girl. I absolutely adored him. And I think we, I think we had a very special relationship. I mean, he was... God, now I'm going to start. Sorry. I didn't think I was going to do this today. Sorry. He met people and was nice to people, and then he walked away. You know, I mean, he was very private in his life, and I think that that created a sense of loneliness in the fact that the group of friends he had was so small and so privileged that when he was out of it, I always looked at him sometimes, and he was talking, but he was looking through the people, and it looked lonely, you know. Well, my wife always said that as well. He just had that thing that made you feel... I'm trying to explain it, but I can't explain it. Sometimes, you know, geniuses are lonely, aren't they? Then I think of the laughs again. <laughs> I think of Tina throwing a <laughs> gin and tonic over it one night. We were at a, a charity do, and the wives went to the loo and there was two girls in the loo. One said, you asked Bobby Moore to dance and I'll ask Jimmy Tarr back to dance. <laughs> We're sat there and these two lovely girls came and said, will you have a dance with us, please? We said, certainly. So we danced around the floor. And as we danced past the tables where the wives were, Tina slung this drink over him and he went, could you put a bit more gin in the next one, lad? <laughs> <laughs> he knew the importance of being captain of England, playing for his country, captain of his country, and he had to uh, be a role model to youngsters who, you know, see him either on television or in, you know, a normal life. You, yeah, you've got, you've got a role to play. You, do, you don't just go on the field and that's it. When you come off it, you've, you have a, another role to play. And he, he was the, he epitomised that role of a role model for people and youngsters to look up to. You have to have an aura about yourself. You have to certainly, you have to uh, 
without being arrogant or, or ignorant, you have to think you're a good player. First and foremost, you wouldn't have had the England captaincy if you if you weren't a, a very good player. And um, he was that, and certainly uh, had the respect of his teammates around him. There's no doubt about that. Speaking to players who played with him in that um, cup winning side, um, you never ever hear anyone have a bad word for Bobby. Bobby Moore, England captain for the 1970 World Cup in Mexico, became the focus for intense diplomatic activity after being arrested for allegedly stealing an emerald bracelet. I was in bed and the phone went, it was about two in the morning, and someone said to me, have you heard what's happened to Bobby? And I went, oh, God, what, 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 what's happened? So he had an accident, they stole him, I went, he's been accused of stealing a bracelet. I went, oh, don't be ridiculous, and I've hung up. And then I woke up in the morning, I could hear this buzz, and I've looked outside, and was, this lawn was littered with cameras and TV vans. He opened with his left hand, opened the window, took out the bracelet and put it in his pocket. I'm very depressed, and I can assure you that I feel very sorry for Bobby Moore. But it's not my fault, and I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I was there, um, and everybody had done exactly what Bob and our kid had done. Because you've got to understand, when we got there, the ambassador came to meet us. This is Bogota, he says, in Colombia. He said, you do not go out alone. You go out minimum of threes and fours and you stick together, he said, because this is a very, very poor country. I remember it particularly because we had gone up to the rooms, put our bags in, we came down, and it was like a big foyer, but all along that side were shops. The reception area was at the far end, about 50, 60 yards away, and we went in and out of the shops and had a look, see what was in, and then we went and sat down and we were playing cards, and our kid and Bobby Moore came across and stood at the end of the chair and they were watching with the cards. And then a woman came across with this guy, with, a, with a, somebody, and she said, uh, this one and this one. And Bob went, what, what's your problem? And he, she, the guy said, uh, you, you were in the shop. Yeah. And Bob said, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I said, we all said, well, we've all been in the shop. And the girl said, uh, no, no, only these two have been in the shop. I said, no, 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 we were, I was in the shop. Bolly was in the shop. Anyway, they, 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 they said, well, what is it? And, and, the, and the man said, uh, something has disappeared from the, the shop. Didn't say what. So Bob says, well, search us. He said, we've just come from the shop, search us. And he said, no, no, it's OK, Mr. it's OK, no problem. And then they went away. The nonsense about Bogota and the place, absolute nonsense. I'd really, it's, it's not even worth talking about. But uh, what really upsets me about that is that that for, for all the talent and skill that Bobby Moore had, maybe down the line, that's all that some people will remember. That could never happen with Bobby Moore. In the beginning, when I got to know Bobby and people were telling me things about Bobby, I heard about this um, Bogota bracelet incident. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I'm gonna have to ask him about this. This does not sound very good at all. And, um, I remember asking him if he'd taken it. I said, I've heard about this, and, and did you in fact take it? And he just looked at me for a moment and said, what do you think? And I said, well, I don't know, that's why I'm asking you, but I would hope you hadn't taken it, but I don't know. And he said, well, I'm sad that you have to ask me that. But in fact, no, I didn't take it. And, I lay and he didn't tell me anything very much more about it at the time. I think he was genuinely saddened that I'd had to ask him, that I had so little faith at that time that I'd had to ask him. Um, but later on, years later, it was discussed on occasions, and um, he said, uh, in fact quite latterly, that he'd spent eight years trying to clear his name. And it has, in fact, caused him, caused him quite a lot of pain, the fact that he'd never been able to bring this to court properly to clear his name. There it, was, it was thrown out in the end, there wasn't enough evidence. And it was genuinely accepted, generally accepted in those circles, that it was a put-up job, it was a political thing around the game and it happened to other people before in the same hotel.
a fantastic person, you know, everybody who knows him, who knew him before, who was with him, you know, uh, have a very, very nice, uh, remember, nice experience. I think this is, is hard to say because when they started to think you know, about the, the good person who we lost here, good example like him outside of the field, this means a lot for us. Alex Stock called me into Fulham one day and he, and he took me up to his office and said, I've got something to say to you. I thought I was going to get the sack, actually. And he said, um, how well do you know Bobby Moore? I said, extremely well, you know, with England and as kids and things like this. He said, um, would you be worried if he came to Fulham? I said, not likely. I said, the fellow we got playing alongside the centre half is not much good. We need something like Moro. So he said, well, he said, we've got a chance to sign him. He said, you wouldn't like to go over to West Ham and sign him for us, would you? And I think Alec was in awe of Bobby at that time. So he said, you know him better than I do, go over and sign him. Very pleased indeed, I'm highly delighted. Uh, you know, I know quite a lot of people at Fulham, got quite a lot of friends there and uh, know quite a lot of their players and looking forward to it very well. The only problem come was his first game, we were playing um, Middlesbrough and at that time they were first, well, going in the first division under Jackie Charlton and were beating everybody in sight and his first game we were 4-0 down after 20 minutes and as he picked the ball out the net, you know, for the fourth goal, he walked up alongside me, put his arm in me and he said, I think I might have made a mistake, mate. FA Cup final for Harry to Moore. And there's the old master again. Billy Jennings screaming for gets it. Taylor turns it back, yes! And a Taylor! One nil to West Ham! Second in the line of players. Bobby Moore. We were walking off the pitch at Wembley and I was a bit down in the dumps and he put his arm around me and he said, did you enjoy it? And I said, no, I didn't really. I said, because we got beat. He said, hold on. He said, two guys our age shouldn't be playing in cup finals. It was an absolute scandal that he was not better used by the game. You know, this is the man who, who, who landed us the World Cup in 1966. Yes, Jeff Hurst got the hat trick, but Bobby Moore was the inspirational character. He was the lead character from 63, 64 through. You know, he was the golden boy. He was the people's captain. And for the game's authorities not to use him, was, I think, scandalous. And for the Games authorities to, I think it was posthumously, dedicate a bridge at Wembley Stadium under which England fans uh, pause to have a pee on the way into the ground, it's just, yeah, it's disgusting. <laughs> professional football and when I got that opportunity I wanted to make my mark you know in West Ham's A team to begin with then get a regular place in the reserves and I've always said if and when I become a manager I would be at the bottom rung of the ladder again beginning all over again. When you want to get in two or three minutes got out go. Last season wasn't a particularly easy season it was quite traumatic you know because we never really knew exactly what was happening on a day-to-day -day basis other than that we were going to be walking into more and more problems. It would be one day whether the bailiffs were coming in one day, there was a winding up petition, the Inland Revenue would be in the next day, the VAT people the next day, and all of a sudden people would say, oh, by the way, there's a game tomorrow. Did you realise? I was at Phoenix in Arizona and suddenly Bobby rings me up and says, Harry, I've took over, I've got the job at Oxford. I thought, that's great, Bob. You know, it's, he said, listen, I want you to come back and work with me. We'll have a year here, use it as a stepping stone. And from here, I'm sure we can go and get a bigger club. And I, I had so much confidence in Bob that he would get a bigger club because his knowledge of the game was fantastic. 
He had an aura about him. Uh, people loved him, people, players respected him. There was no way he could have failed, in my opinion, if he'd have got the right job. So I thought, well, yeah, Oxford would do us as a start. We'd go to have a year there. It's a good club, Oxford. Came back when I got home, finished in America. It was Oxford City, not Oxford United. It was Oxford. They were in the Ishmian League, not the Football League. So it was a bit of a shock, you know. But uh, anyway, I think I was getting about £95 a week at the time. And uh, it was Tuesday, Thursday night training. We're playing in the non-league. And I used to go and play, we'd go away and play at Averley or Tilbury and all these teams, you know, and I used to sit there some nights pouring with rain on a freezing cold night in the middle of winter. And I used to think in the dugout sitting, I think, what am I doing here, you know? And I'd look across at Bobby and i think, what is he doing here? I mean, he wrote for jobs, 18 clubs, and I've been told that two people, that he only got two replies or, you know, some people didn't even bother to reply. And that wasn't my dad, my dad always respected people. He wanted that back. He never got it off people, and I really don't know why people are like that. If someone approached Bobby, he always assumed that they meant well. Um, and I think probably in most cases they did. Um, the pity of it was that it was, in an, it was before the era when you simply gave your name. And if you want to do business with one of today's great stars, you buy their name. But in those days, the celebrity was um, required to invest. So whatever capital he'd managed to accrue was being invested in deals which were unfortunate. Warston Hall was the most incredible country house, but it was a bad, bad affair. I don't know quite what happened, but somebody drove past his house and shot in the window. Oh, God, it was a nightmare. So really, and then we, we knew nothing about this country club. We had very grandiose ideas. We had the very best of everything. We had more cooks in the kitchen than the Dorchester, I think, and, but we couldn't make it work. And in the end, we were left with a huge, huge bill. One by one, the other people managed to get out, and it was left to Bobby to pay this huge amount. I think it was somewhere in about 80, 100,000 pounds, which was a fortune. And then, of course, he had his other two friends, were Patsy and Jimmy Quill, who were publicans in the East End. And um, they'd practically come out of the pub trade. And Bobby said, uh, you know, I'd like a pub. And Jimmy said, well, OK, what do you want to do? So they took a pub in Stratford. And then Jimmy said, we said, well, we messed about with one, we might as well have two or three. So then they took the Blind Beggars at Whitechapel and two other pubs in that area. So they had four then. So Bob said, you know, what are you doing? Well, we might pop in the Blind Beggars for a lager on the way home. I went to go to the toilet and a guy follows me in there. And if you could have imagined a gangster, this was him. I mean, he was, you know, he had a big scar across his face, big black overcoat on, big white pocket handkerchief. He'd have been made a perfect Al Capone. Followed me in the toilet, he said, tell your mate Bobby Moore, he said, I'm going to cut him from ear to ear. So I said, why, what, what's the problem? He said, ah, he thinks he's a film star. So I thought, well, of all the people I know that don't think they're a film star, it's Bobby, you know? And I went back to tell Bob to, you know, <laughs> he'd better, we'd better get out of there a bit lively because this guy did look a bit vicious. Is there any, any more? Any more? Yes. Oh. I was playing football in Gotland, a little island off Sweden, and uh, Bobby had been playing in South Africa. I'm Bobby Moore. Pardon? I'm Bobby Moore. And uh, he was flying from South Africa. I'm sorry, I don't care if you're old Moore. What to London and going on to Gotland, to Sweden, and coming to see me. Football? football? But look, I've got enough to cope here with a tennis player. I mean, this is ridiculous, isn't it? Look, go and find an empty stadium and play it as a good boy. Go and enjoy yourself. That's right. Thank you very much. What a funny thing you are doing. And uh, I meant to meet him. And we only walked about 50 yards. He said, I should have just fallen in love. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've just fallen in love. I just met this fantastic woman. And that was it. We met in South Africa, in Johannesburg. I'd been invited with some friends to a football match on the outskirts of Soweto. In those days, apartheid was in situ, and I didn't think South Africa was a very pleasant place to be. And uh, I jumped at the chance of being able to go to somewhere like that, very close to Soweto, to see what it was like. And in fact, it was my first ever football match, but it wasn't the football that drew me. And in fact, I don't remember anything about the football match. I remember it being very, very cold and bleak. And 
we reciprocated by having a small party afterwards, which the team came to, and that's where Bobby and I met. And that meeting, in fact, changed both our lives so drastically. Whilst I'd heard the name Bobby Moore, obviously, I didn't know what he looked like or who he was. <laughs> because he's such a household name and such a legend that um, I don't think I'm believed when I say that. But it is honestly true, I did not know who he was or what his history was. Um, uh, I certainly do now. When Bobby and I got together, he was at a crossroads in his life. He'd finished his professional footballing career, and he, and he was looking for a new way of making a living, and it was not easy. And at the same time, he'd reached a crossroads in his life domestically. Um, he, he was in an unhappy marriage, and um, the guilt he felt about leaving his family was enormous. I, th I don't think he ever overcame it. Um, it, it was genuine anguish. Um, and whilst he never t talked to me about it at the time, um, I realised later that it had cost him very dearly, not just financially, but emotionally. And in terms of finance, he, he gave the family everything. I mean, he, he had to start at the age of 40 with nothing. So there were times when it was very difficult for us, and we did struggle at the beginning. It still hurts, you know. He left his kids, he left his, the woman he loved for 20-odd years. That must have been a very, very hard decision. Uh, what, not one he took lightly, I don't suppose, but at the end of the day, people do what they think is best for themselves. You know, whether, it, whether it's right or wrong is a different matter, but... He did everything better than me. He was a nightmare. Whether it was keeping the house clean or cooking or whatever it was, um, flower decorating, the whole thing, he, he always seemed to be, um, he was such a perfectionist and, and he loved life at home, simple life at home. Um, I mean, our greatest pleasure was um, spending hours out on the heath or the common with the dogs. And no matter how hard he'd been working, we would always sit down and, and discuss what we'd both been doing, and particularly Sundays, a late cooked Sunday lunch in front of a, a fire in the lounge was his idea of utopia. During the time that I knew him, he was extremely fit and well, but I did insist that he have a complete medical checkup at the age of 43 or something, I can't remember, yeah, 43, 44. He'd never had one. I couldn't believe that a professional footballer had never had a complete medical checkup. So we, he, I insisted and insisted, and eventually we went to Booper or whoever to get this medical checkup, and they said, we'll do an ECG. Can we have a look at your previous ECGs? And he said, well, I don't have any. And they, they too were astounded that this man, I mean, had it been Beckham, you know, that he'd have an ECG every month. We needed someone to work with us on the radio uh, in the year building up to World Cup 1990, and uh, Bobby was at that stage the sort of uh, nominal sports editor of the Sunday Sport newspaper, and I knew that he wanted to get back to going to games because he loved the game so much. His enthusiasm for it was, you know, boundless. We, we'd be in London on a Saturday and Newcastle on a Sunday, and Bobby would drive. You know, and he, he was the one that used to do all the, all the donkey work. We broke down once with inside to Villa Park, and I said to Bob, we, we get, you know, I'm going to have to climb down the embankment and get to the ground that way. You know, time's ticking on. Don't worry, Pierre, so someone will come along. Sure enough, big ra Range Rover comes along, blue lights on and all this sort of stuff. You can't stop here, sir. I, is it Bobby Moore? Is it Bobby Moore? Yes, indeed, it is, officer. He gets his Range Rover behind... Bobby's car and pushes us, not tows us or waits for a tow truck, pushes us up off the motorway, down the right road, and Bobby cruised it, and then we parked in a nice spot. I'll be all right here, officer. You'll be all right anyway, Mr Moore. And that was, that, was, that was Bobby all over, you know. We used to get from point A to point B in about 30 minutes, even if it was 500 miles, you know. Bobby used to go outside lane. People used to see him coming, you know. It's Bobby Moore, shoom, up we went, cruised it. came into work on the Monday and said, I need to speak to you. And he called me up to his office and just said, they found cancer. And I remember he, he was filling in um, 
an acceptance form to play in a pro-am golf tournament and it was for cancer research and he sort of filled in he said oh, I hope they can help me this time. I went with Bobby um, to every doctor's appointment and every treatment he had there and after but I, I was at this particular um, meeting with the, st the specialist and he told Bobby he there was nothing wrong with him it, he might have irritable bowel syndrome and in which case he would have to learn to live with it and uh, get on with life and forget about it. The symptoms continued and it was four years before he was properly diagnosed. When Bobby came out of hospital he knew that it was not treatable. He knew he was going to die. He didn't know how long he had. He never asked and so I never asked. Um, in fact he had just under two years but some months later he said to me what do you think about all this? I remember he was in the bath at the time and I, I thought, God, I mean, I, I just didn't know how to cope with this at all. I thought, well, what does one say? I mean, I was livid, but it wasn't going to help Bobby to know that. And so I said, well, I think that what's happened in the past has happened. I think what we have to concentrate on now is the time that we have together and make sure that the time that we have, and hopefully it'll be a long time, is as full and as, as meaningful as we can make it and not dwell on stuff that's just going to make us angry and unhappy. And so that's what we did. He came down to Bournemouth and spent a few days with us down here. And when I went and picked him up to meet him, I was sitting in a car and uh, when I saw him walk across the road, uh, I didn't want him to get to the car too soon because uh, I was crying and uh, it absolutely slaughtered me. I couldn't believe it. You know, he's, he's, he had no... His trousers rang off him. He always had them big legs and everything, and suddenly I was looking at him and there was nothing of him. And um, so I didn't want to, you know, make a fool of myself in front of him. But it was, it was a difficult, you know, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The day it was announced that he was ill, it sort of hit the papers. He did a couple of radio... I don't know, there was a press release and then there was some you know, newspaper, some newspaper coverage the next day. And I went round to see him after work and he sat on the sofa next to me and I said, he said, so was there anything in the papers today? And I said, yes. And he said, has anyone said anything detrimental? I mean, detrimental? Just, I mean, he was so unassuming. He really was. And, I, he, you know, he just, he, he just had no idea how much people thought of him. He just had no idea. The last time he went to Wembley, the traffic was absolutely chaotic and we couldn't find anywhere to park. So Dad, typical Dad, just got out of the car and just started directing the traffic. Like, you park there, you park there. I mean, he just had this instinctive to sort it out. And within a second, everyone was parked. And then we went up the steps to Wembley. This photographer came up and sort of shoved a camera in his face. Dad just turned around and said, I just leave them, because I sort of shouted at the photographer, leave them alone, you know, what are you doing? And he said, come on, don't worry about it. Then we went inside, and Dad was going up in the lift to the press room. Someone turned around and said, oh, big game tonight, Bobby, we could do with you out there. And he just turned around and he went, yeah, I think I might need a late fitness test. And he phoned up for lunch. He said, can we go somewhere nice and private, quiet? I said, yeah, no problem. I said, oh, the Ramada Hotel's there, and there's a little Italian restaurant next door, because I know he liked a bit of pasta. So I said, oh, if you drive down into there's a private car park there, I'll meet you in reception. So, of course, I go. I never recognised him. I never recognised him. Couldn't walk properly. He was so thin. He was... But he was still the same, you know. He wasn't... I feel sorry for myself. He was still the same. S smiled, oh, yeah. But I knew then, you know, and I think he'd just come to say goodbye, to be honest, on the way by. And we went into the restaurant and... Uh, 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 you know, I always remember a little, a little bit of blood came down his nose you know, and I wiped it away, you know, I thought... We went straight to the house and Dad used to call me Dolly Drops and I went up to his bedroom and he was lying in bed. And, uh, and I just walked over and he sort, of, he was sort of drifting in and out of consciousness and he came over and he opened his eyes and he just kissed me on the nose and went, hello, Dolly Drops. And he went, I love you, Dolly Drops. 
And then he sort of just smiled. And I just held his hand. I mean, you know, there was, there was nothing anyone could do. You just had to be there with him. And just laid with him all night next to him. And he, you know, he, he was literally just drifting in and out of consciousness. And, um, he, uh, and he, he just sort of came to a couple of times and just said, you know, I love you. And you just want to, I just wanted to tell him how much I loved him, which I did. And then the next morning, it was just, just gone half past six, he just, he, uh, it sounds really odd, but he, when he took his last breath, and I knew he'd gone, I just had the most... I was lying next to him on the bed, and I just had the most unbelievable surge of energy go through me. Just the most unbelievable warmth spread... Unbelievable warmth spread through me, and I mean, I don't know, and I know it might sound a bit cranky, but I believe his soul passed through me. That's what I believe, and that's what gives me comfort. And on the Wednesday morning, I left for a holiday in Goa, and I never spoke to Bobby again. The most amazing thing happened to me when I was there. I got to the hotel in Goa, and this is then, you know, it's not like Goa is now. You couldn't phone out of the hotel, but they'd had a phone call in from, from, from Capital in London um, saying that a close friend of mine had died. Um, so the hotel manager called me into his office and said, this, we've got a message uh, from uh, England. Um, if you want to make a call, there's a post office in the village. So they ordered a taxi for me and I got into this taxi and for some reason I said to the taxi driver, I've, uh, I've got bad news, uh, someone who's close to me in England has died and I, get, and I gave him the name of the person. I don't know why I did, but I did. And we went to this post office in the middle of the jungle in Goa, tens of thousands of miles away. Three walls, no front, corrugated iron roof, one phone. And I went in there and they chat me up to London so that I could speak to the office and they confirmed that Bobby died that morning, early that morning. And uh, again, the tears started to fall and I turned around and the entire road in front of the post office was jammed with people. And the taxi driver had told people in the village that Bobby Moore had died. And all those thousands of miles away in a jungle village in Goa in 1993, they knew who Bobby Moore was and the entire population had turned out. And it was only at that moment that I realised what Bobby was to so many people. The turnout was tremendous. The outpouring of a nation's grief. I mean, the obituaries read like for a monarch. But of course, he was a king amongst the common man. He certainly was. He was the boy from Barking who became a hero, a real national hero. It's a word that's often misused but certainly not in Bob's case. It's just not damn fair that he went so young. And they explained to me what you did. I mean, it's nerve wracking. It's all right going on the Palladium. I know what I'm doing or half know what I'm doing. In, in a place where the kings and queen of England have been buried and have been um, um, crowned and everything, just slightly out of my depth, sir. Just slightly out of my depth. And I, and, I just stood up and I half expected him to walk down the aisle and go, hey Jimbo, what are you doing up there? Yeah. I remember my children asking to come. They wanted to come. They wanted to remember Uncle Bob. What I remember most of all, Bobby Charlton was just going up to speak and my wife just said, Bobby's just flown in. I said, Leslie. What do you want about? She said, there's a dove just flown across the top of the, the abbey. I said, Leslie, are you sure? And she said, yes. His death made you feel you'd lost contact with a better time, a more certain time, a time when good beat bad, a time when better values probably prevailed, a time that was more straightforward, a time that was cleaner, because he had all of that and he personified all of that. He cut across class in a way that not many people 
do in this country. There's certain players have got that certain aura about them where they walk into a room and, and people look round and notice and that's what Bobby Moore had. He walked into a room, people stood up and clapped, people looked round with amazement. It wasn't like us. It wasn't like us. He was one of us, but he wasn't like us. Everybody f thought the same things about Bob. He wanted to play certain golf courses. And I remember we uh, went up to Scotland to play Carnoustie. I mean, I'm not a golfer, and it, the, the, uh, the, the guy on the green said, oh, it's a wonderful day. And I thought, my God, if this is a wonderful day, I mean, what's it normally like? It was blowing an eight-force gale. All I could see was flat land everywhere. It was terribly bleak, and this was a wonderful day. Bobby loved it. He loved it, and St Andrews, and he loved his golf. He we did a little bit of fishing, which he also enjoyed, salmon fishing. Um, yeah, there were various things he wanted to do. I think the most frightening was the white river rafting in, on the Zambezi. Um, when he had terminal <laughs> cancer, it was not a good idea, but anyway. Uh, yes, he, he lived life totally to the full. Um, everything about him. Mm. And I miss him every day. <laughs> <laughs>